rock of my salvation. Thank you, worship team. She kind of just said, she leaned over to me and said, I feel like we're in Branson. <laughs> With that song? Okay, you, you get it. Uh, you know, actually, Kim and I, Kim used to sing that song, I uh, Go to the Rock. So Kim and I actually met in Bible college in a traveling music group. So I played trumpet and she sang. So Kim was a, a growling alto camp meeting singer. How many of you remember growling alto camp meeting? And so that was the kind of singer uh, Kim was. I don't know if you've heard of Nancy Harmon in the Victory Voices or Karen Wheaton. Some of you heard of Karen Wheaton. And so uh, Kim sings. They used to sing a lot of songs like hers. In fact, back in the 90s, we preached a lot of church, uh, church in Kansas City called Sheffield. And um, so we preached there several times in the 90s. And one time we were preaching just a couple of weeks after Karen Wheaton had done a concert and ministry there. And Kim said, I am not singing Karen Wheaton's song two weeks after Karen Wheaton sang it. But uh, it, it's uh, great. So back, back when Kim and I first started traveling 37 years ago, she sang. And we actually uh, did a couple of, of albums together and, and different things. But uh, Kim, uh, we, we, I, I messaged her back and forth on this afternoon. She sends her greetings. Thank you for your prayers as well for her. God's restoring her to the fullness of health. Well, look, thank you for being out with us tonight. We uh, appreciate it so much. Believe God's going to just continue to minister, touch in the, the midst of our storms, calm the storms, release His miracles, release the Word of the Lord to bring encouragement, strength, and comfort. Um, you know, one of the, the uh, tools or one of the, the purposes of prophecy is to encourage. That's what 1 Corinthians 14 says. Do you know the root word of encourage is courage? And so what it is, is many times the enemy and the battle going through the trials and tribulations, severely, they come to discourage us, to try to rob us of our courage to face tomorrow. And so you know what the Word of the Lord does? He comes along through the Word and the Scripture and the Spirit to say, you are more than a conqueror. The song we were singing earlier, you are more than victorious. And so that's what we believe God to do this evening, encouraged by the Word of the Lord, our hearts to know that God has promised us that through Jesus we are more than conquerors, but not only in our own lives, that God wants to use you as normal, ordinary people. How many of you are somewhat normal? Normal, ordinary people to release the miraculous power of Jesus and, and His heart and His love uh, to people around you. So, Pastor Tim, Debbie, thank you all for letting us come and hang out with you. Um, before we, we go to the Word for a few moments and move into ministry, she kind of is going to share another uh, devotional. So we started writing these actually back, how old were you? You were fairly young. Um, is it even, even a little bit younger than that, I think. But back in her, her mid and late teens, she started writing uh, devotionals and inspirational thoughts. And it's just continuing to grow and, and mature. And so we're working on getting some of them together. But there's a, a devotion that she'd written that God dropped in her heart. And so she's going to share that with us. So open your hearts and allow the Lord to encourage and strengthen you as she uh, shares. So this was laid on my heart this afternoon because we were actually eating Chinese um, after service. And we, this was one of the conversations that we had about your calling and about wondering if you can fulfill your calling. And so the Lord brought me back to a devotion I wrote a couple of years ago. So um, just open up your heart. Being called by God. Many times when you're called by God to do something, you have little to no say about it. It's not something you plan for, and it's not something you wish into existence. God's plan for you is better and richer than whatever plans you have for yourself. When you're called, you may not be prepared. You may not feel like you're ready, but God will prepare and ready you. However, if you're called and have been actively trying to run away from that calling, you're only setting yourself up for trouble. I heard a quote once that said, he doesn't qu call the qualified, he qualifies the called. If your calling scares you, you're not alone. I believe a majority of people that feel called to something might feel as if they're inadequate to the call. You might feel uneducated, unprepared, and unqualified. Truthfully, you might feel terrified that you'll mess up or terrified of how people will treat you because of your call. The Bible has several incidents of people being called but feeling scared or unqualified. Jonah is the poster boy for this kind of situation. Jonah had a call in his life designed by God, yet he continually ran from it. He felt that his calling was fishy. <laughs> Thank you for the pity laugh. He was scared, scared of not knowing what to say, scared of how the Ninevites would react to his words of condemnation, to their sin. So he ran. 
He ran from his call. He ran from God, and he was even running from himself. His running eventually caused him to be swallowed by a whale. When he was spit out, he knew that running from his calling did no good. Was he still scared? Oh, absolutely. But the call was greater than the fear. He fulfilled God's plan for him. He just had to have the courage to accept his call rather than run. Moses was a man who dedicated his life to the Lord. When you think of Moses, you might think of the parting of the Red Sea or leading the Israelites to the promised land. However, his was also a story of running from the calling at first. Moses was good at many things. Speaking was not one of them. Uh, wait, sorry. Um, speaking was not one of them. Moses had a stutter, which led him to feel inadequate for the job that God called him to do. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush and told him that his call was to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let the Israelites go. Moses used every excuse he could think of to try to convince God that he was not the right man for the job. Fear overtook faith. He was scared of his call, scared that a stutter would fail him, scared that he wouldn't find the right words, and scared of how the Pharaoh would react. After arguing with the Lord, Moses finally gave in and had Aaron by his side, which gave him a small level of peace. After a long time of resistance, Pharaoh did indeed let the Israelites go. Moses fulfilled his call from God, but his future couldn't come to fruition until he accepted his call and put his faith in God who created his call. Gideon, who was a faithful worker in a time where he and his people were oppressed. Where do we find first meet him, though, in the Bible? We meet him as he's hiding. He was not the strong one. He was not the strategic one. He was overlooked and to most was thought of as weak. Yet God sent an angel to him, and the first words out of the angel's mouth was, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. God called him because he saw the potential in him. God was sending Gideon to defeat the same people that had oppressed him and his people. Gideon denied, he bargained, and he doubted because he felt undeserving and inadequate of his call. He may have thought that he was weak, but God saw the strength inside. Gideon became a warrior for Yahweh and ended up defeating the Midianites with only a fraction of the army that is logically possible. When God calls you, it doesn't matter what makes sense logically because God will make the impossible possible. The first step, though, is accepting that you're called. You might feel that nudging of being called to something, but doubt starts to creep in. You might feel like you don't know what you're doing, and so you run and you deny that call. You can't run from your calling forever. No matter how far you run, that call will follow you. God doesn't call you for you to fail. He calls you because he sees and knows your potential. So trust your calling. Amen. Thank you, Shekinah. You know, that's a true statement, God. Qualifies the call. The Bible says that there are not many rich, not many powerful, not many talented that uh, God uses and God calls. How many of you fit the bill? <clears throat> um, the word says he chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So how many of you are in good company? I remember um, I, I told you I was a street preacher when I was a teenager and in my 20s. And several times we went out to Mardi Gras <clears throat> in New Orleans to preach on the streets and I mean, it's just, you know, horrendous sin and perversion and drunkenness down there. And I remember I was down there preaching on the streets and sharing Jesus. And, and one time an older gentleman grabbed me by the arm and he said, I want to get a picture of one of you Jesus freaks with my wife. And so I said, okay, here I am. And he got a picture. And before he walked away and I said, sir, you're right. I'm a freak for Jesus. Whose freak are you? Whose fool are you? Anybody remember back in the 70s or 80s where a song says, everybody's somebody's fool. And we will be a fool for something or someone. And a lot of people are fool for sin. I mean, you know, people will, will destroy their lives running after sin and foolishness and ignorance and stupidity and insanity, and yet they don't see the foolishness of it. But even in the church world, if we're not careful, we'll become fools for religion, for tradition, for our opinions. But God is looking for people like John the Baptist of no reputation. I must decrease and he must increase. Now that doesn't mean we have to act weird to be anointed. Have you ever met people like that? They think the weirder they act, the more anointed they are. I call them granola Christians, nuts, flakes, and fruits. 
You don't have to act strange. You don't have to walk around like your head is in the cloud and you're always conversing with angels to believe or for people to know that you are anointed. We are called to be naturally supernatural, to express Jesus in a normal, natural way because the average person out there doesn't know church culture. And so if we go into, I, I, I say it this way, if you go into Walmart and happen to be not at the self-checkout anymore, but actually go where there's a cashier and God gives you a word for the cashier, can I tell you something? You probably can't sing for 15 minutes, shake a little bit and give the word. That's our Pentecostal style. They'll be bringing uh, the men with the white coats to take you out. We've got to learn how to let the supernatural power of God and word and heart of God flow through us in normal and natural ways. And so I'm going to take us back to Matthew chapter 14. This morning we were talking some out of the story of Jesus walking on the water and calming the storm. So we're going to go back and revisit that story here in just a moment. But I, I want to kind of set the stage with a little bit of my own uh, testimony and walk. I probably shared some of this over the course of the times we've been with you all. So without, uh, you know, be, be, uh, uh, belaboring it all, uh, I, I grew up in a, um, a dysfunctional situation. And so as a, um, as a nine-year-old boy, I'd come to Christ when I was about five years old in the Baptist church. You know, probably the worst sin I'd ever done was steal an Oreo cookie. But I, I knew I needed salvation. I gave my life to Jesus. And, and so, um, you know, was, was, you know, versed in salvation and the Word and Sunday school. And then I remember as an eight- and nine-year-old boy, we moved to Virginia. I was uh, born in Hawaii because my dad was Navy, lived in the island of Cuba for four years in the 60s, shortly after the, the Bay of Pigs uh, situation. And 1971, 72, we moved to the area of Virginia we live in now, Hampton Roads. And it was back when Pat Robertson, you know Pat Robertson, 700 Club? It was back when he was local. So he's about 45 minutes away, Virginia Beach. And so I remember as an eight, nine-year-old boy watching Pat Roberts and Jim and Tammy Baker back in the day and all these things, and they'd be on the air at 1, 2 in the morning calling out words of knowledge and, and praying and speaking in tongues and prophesying, and people were calling in, testifying of being healed and delivered and saved. And there was something about this real practical expression of the power of God that grabbed a hold of this young heart. And yet, in, in the midst of the Holy Spirit drawing me and, and beginning to stir my heart, things in my natural life were, were not going well. And so, as, as a nine-year-old boy, I hit a place where um, I, I threatened to kill somebody and then take my own life. As a nine-year-old boy. And shortly after that, we went to a concert, a Christian concert at a high school in town. And they gave an altar call. And I already was saved, but I, I just, I needed, I needed God in that moment. And so I went up to the front, and one of the singers told me to say, praise the Lord. So I said, praise the Lord. She said, now say it over and over. So I was going, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. She said, now say it fast. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Next thing I knew, I was speaking in tongues. Now, how many of you know that's not great theology? But God honored the faith of this little boy, and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that night... The Holy Spirit spoke to this little nine-year-old, broken, fat, shy little kid that was, you know, uh, falling apart inside. And he said, read Jeremiah 1, because Russ, that's my purpose and call for you. And that's where God said to Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. From the womb, I ordained you and sanctified you a prophet to the nations. And so I went to my parents, and I, you know, I was a little nine-year-old boy, and I said, I believe God has called me to the nations to be a missionary, and, and there, there was the, the aspect of the prophetic and all of that. And so again, going back to God doesn't call the qualified, He qualifies the called. God took a broken nine-year-old little boy and said, I'm going to send you as a mouthpiece to the nations of the earth. That makes no practical sense. I had nothing practically to offer God. But then uh, we, 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 I went into the Assemblies of God, and we had great children's church leaders. So when I was 9, 10, 11 years old, we'd have fun. Anybody remember the felt boards that you used to tell stories in Sunday school back before technology? You know, so we had fun, the Sunday school songs and children's show, all, all that stuff and the things. But they also taught us that children could be used by the Holy Spirit. 
And so as nine, ten-year-old boy, we were being taught we could lay hands on the sick in Jesus' name and he would heal them. We were being taught that we could lead people to Jesus, that we could pray for people and they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I was blessed to have people, not only you know parents, but also uh, leaders in my life that believe that God doesn't bypass the young generation, that children don't have a junior Holy Spirit. And so, uh, you know, growing up in that, and then about 15 years old, um, some Jesus freaks, some of the, I was talking this morning about, you know, the hippies from the Jesus Revolution days. So about 15 years old, they got a hold of me and got me on the streets preaching. And so it was Virginia Beach and Hampton, Virginia, and the East Coast of America, where it started out. Carrying a 10-foot cross, preaching on the streets, pulling up with a giant, we had a giant orange van. We called it the Great Pumpkin. And so it was, you know, one of those hippie vans, and we would get speakers. You know how speakers were back then, giant speakers, and we'd get Petra and Rez Band and, you know, Second Chapter of Acts and Chuck Gerard and, you know, all these different ones. We'd be blasting that out on the beach um, where, where we lived, and people would, you know, come up back in, you know, still some of the drug days, and they'd, hey, man, want a J? And I'd say, man, I got a greater J than what you've got. His name is Jesus. You know, all the other preacher stuff we used to do, and, you know, uh, you know, Coors was the silver bullet. We'd say the silver bullet will put you six feet under. But, you know, gee, anyway, you know, we did all these, these things. But I began to see people come to Christ as a teenager. Just, a, 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 you know, a, a kid that didn't have a whole lot to offer. And yet God saw something in me and said, I want to use you to release my love and my power. As a 15-year-old, uh, I remember I was in a Catholic charismatic meeting. I was never Catholic, but uh, it was during the time when the Holy Spirit was invading Catholic people, and they realized that praying to Mary and going to confession was not enough, that Jesus was the mediator. And they came to Christ. And when they came to Christ, some of them left the Catholic Church, some did not. But you know what? They were serving Jesus, then they got filled with the Spirit. And they were speaking in tongues. And I remember as a 15-year-old boy, we're praying for another young man about my age. He had one leg two inches shorter than the other. He wore a brace, uh, a two-inch brace on, on one uh, a shoe. And so we sat him down in a chair. And, and again, I'm, I'm not leading this. I'm just a 15-year-old kid watching. And we, we start praying. He'll stretch his legs out and start praying. And I watch with my eyes as his leg grew. And I'm not talking about bounce the legs a little bit so it looks like they grew a quarter of an inch. I'm talking about watching a miracle of God. And then, 16 years old, I, um, I, I, uh, I'm bringing a young man. He's uh, about 14, 15 years old, something like that. I'm 16 or so, and he's part of our youth group, but he got heavily involved in demonic rock music. And he was having gruesome nightmares, demonic nightmares. And I was giving him a, home, uh, him a, a ride home after youth service one day. And so we're sitting outside in front of his house. He's telling me about these gruesome dreams. And so I, he said, I, I want to be free of these. So he started praying. And, you know, during this time, I was seeing people saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and healed. But I was petrified of having to face a demon. You know, I, I don't know the, 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 all the stories that, you know, people were, they seemed to be glorifying the people, you know, slithering like snakes and growling and all that. And that, that made me afraid, made me scared. And so, I, you know, I was like, Lord, I want to see the miraculous, but I don't want to face a demon. And so I, I'm praying with this young man. And demonic growling and voices, and I don't have to go into all the mess, started happening. And at first fear came on me, but then I realized I had nothing to fear because I had someone greater in me than he that's in the world. And so I didn't know all the formulas for casting out devils and, you know, all those other things. I mean, the, the young man had turned his heart from God, had, you know, demonic rock music, all the other stuff. And I just took authority in the name of Jesus. And the demons screamed, and we literally felt that presence go out through the windshield of the car. The young man gave his life to Christ and was baptized in the Spirit, speaking in tongues in my car. And so, you know, I, this was, the, the, again, for what, what God was doing in my heart as a young man. And so I started preaching on the streets and preaching in churches at 15 and 16 years old and, and, and these different things and go off to Bible college. And, uh, you know, just we began seeing God do so many other things. Then Kim and I got married, 1984, coming up in May. May 5th will be 39 years. We've been married and 37 years on the road. And, and began traveling. And a, a year into our ministry, uh, we encountered the modern-day prophetic movement. 
And it's a long, long story. I won't get into all of it. But God began stirring that, that call that he put on me at nine years old to not just go to the nations, but to where the prophetic flow to come. And so we began seeing God minister and move, and, and then God began opening the nations. And so over the 37 years, we've been to six continents. The only continent we haven't been to is Antarctica. Not sure how many penguins need a prophecy, but we've been to you know, all the, and, and 40-some nations. And we've seen God do amazing things. And I could tell you about, you know, crusades in India and Africa, I mean, India and Pakistan with, you know, 20 and 30 and 40,000 people and miracles that God did. I could tell you about the underground church in China and in communist Poland back in the day and in Siberia and different places we've been. But sometimes we hear missionaries talk about what God's doing in far-flung nations. And we say, God, what about us? What about our nation? And so that's what we began to see. And so I want to share a few of those things with you, and then we're going to jump into the story because I want us to understand I was not and still am not some big-name person with all these great abilities and talents and pedigree and legacy of everything else. I was a broken kid with, you know, raised in a, in a place that was broken for a while, but then uh, my, my mom, you know, praying and loving and, and, and believing my, my father coming back to the Lord, God doing a measure of healing in my family, and then God releasing us out. But we have seen God right here in our nation through normal, ordinary people do amazing things. Well, we, we, we preached last Sunday, I told you, in Branson, and uh, we were just coming back through Ozark, uh, Missouri, on our way to Springfield, where my mom lives. Several years ago, we were in Ozark Assembly of God, and there was a woman named Linda Sietstra. This is back, gracious, I don't know, 30 years ago. And Linda had been diagnosed with uh, cancer of both breasts. She was scheduled on the Friday of, of that coming week to have a radical mastectomy, both, both breasts removed. And she came up for prayer. I think it was on a Monday night. Came up for prayer. And, and she didn't even tell us what the problem was. She just said, I need God to do a miracle. And so we just agreed together in prayer. It wasn't some screaming, hollering, whatever. It wasn't a word of knowledge. She just said, I need a miracle. We didn't even know what we were praying for. But she had simple faith. And so we prayed, God, release your touch, release your miracle. Well, Linda got a hold of us, and she said she went to the doctor, went to the hospital for a surgery on the Friday. And she told the doctors, I'm not going to let you even begin a surgery until you rerun the test. And the doctor said, you're just scared, you're afraid, we've, we've had multiple tests show that, that you, you need the surgery, you, you, you had cancer, et cetera, et cetera. She said, no, I'm not going to let you do it. And so out of frustration, the doctors re-ran the test, and they ran it over and over again, and Linda was completely cancer-free, even though that she was scheduled to both breasts removed. And it wasn't because she went to the big name healing evangelist. She just went to a normal church service and let some normal person agree with her in prayer. And God did a miracle. Um, oh, let me say, back several years ago as well, we were in a little town called Viburnum, Missouri. Anybody know where Viburnum, Missouri is? It's a suburb of, of St. Louis out near that area. And, um, oh, God was moving in power. And I... Uh, I a lady stood up. Uh, she was probably, oh, in her 50s somewhere. So a youngster. <laughs> no. uh, back in the day, I was in my 20s. And she stood up and she said to the congregation, it was during prayer time, she said, most of you know I've been deaf in this ear for 50 years from an accident when I was growing up on a farm. She said, but what scares me is I'm losing my hearing in the other ear. And she wanted the congregation to pray. And they did. And that's effective. So I came to the pulpit that morning, and the Spirit of God came on me, and I looked at her, and I said, man, tonight God's going to heal you. Then I thought, oh, God, I hope that was you. <laughs> and so she came to the front that night, and I didn't know how to pray for deaf people. I mean, I'd seen TV preachers do it, you know, wow, you know, and, you know, put their fingers in their ear and say, baby, you know. Anyway, I didn't know how to do all this TV preacher stuff. And so, we, you know, we just... I, I did. I put my fingers in her ears, and, and I, I said, in Jesus' name, be healed. Now, you know what? You know what this man of faith did? I quickly went on to the next person because I was scared nothing had happened. Have you ever prayed for somebody to get healed and you're afraid to ask what happened and nothing did happen? And so I was quickly running to the next person. The pastor wasn't going to let me get away with it. And so he said, come on, let's see what happened. 
she testified that when we prayed for her, her deaf ear, they have been deaf for more than 50 years. Bones in the inner ear had been crushed in some kind of an accident 50 years before. She'd been stone deaf in that ear for more than 50 years. She said when the word of the Lord was released, her ear popped open. She went back to the doctor, and God had recreated the crushed bones in her inner ear. I mean, create a miracle. And, and so she was getting on the phone telling people about the miracle of Jesus and leading people to the Lord. And they would be talking, and they're used to talking loud to her. She'd say, talk quieter. I can hear now. I, you know, just, I, I love the things that God is doing. Back in 1997, we were in Venice, Florida, south of Sarasota, south of Tampa. We had a Sunday morning on January 12, 1997. Uh, the pastor said God dropped a bomb on the church and it broke out into a four-month revival. They rented us a house. January, February, March, and April. How many of you know God knows how to schedule revival? Winter revival in Florida. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and so uh, and, and we, we've gone back there many times over the years. And so back several years ago, um, we're ministering. And the Holy Spirit begins, begins to speak. And he, he said, God, there's somebody here that your lungs are diseased, and God wants to heal you and to create a miracle. Well, nobody responded, which makes you feel like, oh, God, did I miss it? Or what's going on? I look foolish. I look wrong. I look unspiritual. I look unanointed. I mean, you know, we, we preachers have normal thoughts, too. And, and so, we, but we, we, we pray, God, whoever that is, release. It's about three years later, we're back down there, and somebody walks up to me and said, I was in that service. I was scheduled for a lung transplant. I was on a waiting list because of the disease in my lungs. And she said, I want you to know that after that word and after that prayer, I went back to the doctors, and they said, it's like you have brand new lungs and brand new tissue. God did a creative miracle. But it was, it was again, it's not through the big name. I'm not against big names, but it was not through the big name healing evangelist. It was a broken, shy little kid that said yes to God. And I'm saying all these things, not for you to think we're anything special, but for us to understand, you can be as ordinary as anything, and yet God will use you to release the miraculous. This morning we were talking about the fact that, that Jesus is building not an audience but an army. And I said something like this, the reality is Cameron is not going to line up to hear me preach. As great of a pastor or preacher as Tim is, they're not going to come and line up just to hear him preach. But you are in their lives. The people you encounter this, this, this city a day after day after day in different realms. And can I tell you, there are people that are broken, that are hurting, that are sick, that are demonized, and they need healing. They need deliverance. They need freedom. And you don't just bring them to church. You are the ecclesia. You are the army of God. You have the keys of the kingdom and so you can cast out devils. You can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You don't have to give money to a preacher to somehow sow into the anointing to get your healing. Guys, you are the body of Christ. And so God wants to not only do miracles for you, but through you. So all of that to take us to Matthew 14. And we were talking this morning about the story of Jesus walking on the water. To remind you, or if you weren't with us this morning, this story of Jesus walking in the water, disciples, and calming the storm is told in different Gospels. And one of the Gospels, I think it might be in John, it makes this statement where the other Gospels don't record it. It said, Jesus was about to pass them by. So this morning I was emphasizing the fact, Jesus told them, go to the other side of the lake, go over there, and I'm going to meet you there. And I heard a preacher say it this way. When Jesus gives us a command, he also gives the authority and the ability to fulfill that command. So everything they needed, even though Jesus knew there would be a storm. Of course he knew. He knows all things. He knew there would be a storm. He didn't say, guys, go to the other side, but, but, the other side of the lake, but look, on your way there, there's going to be a storm. When the storm comes, I want you to rebuke it. I want you to stand in faith. He just said, go. And he expected them to arise in faith. But because they got fearful, Jesus had to turn aside from his plan to meet them on the other side of the lake to go encounter them and still the storm and still their fear. And what it, what, it, what it tells me is this. Not only is God wanting us to arise in faith, but how many of you know we're not perfected in faith yet? 
There are times we face the storms and and we don't know what to do. We're overcome with fear. We're overcome with worry. We're overcome with doubt. Or maybe we try to rebuke it and it doesn't seem to be working. We try to pray and our prayers seem to be hitting a ceiling. We're saying, God, I've tried everything I know to do. I've preached. I've prayed. I've prophesied. I've declared. I've decreed. I've made statements of faith. Lord, I've sowed. I did everything I knew to do. And yet it still doesn't seem like I'm getting victory. Have you been there? Aren't you thankful that Jesus doesn't abandon us in those times? He saw them struggling in the midst of the storm. And so instead of passing them by, he turned aside. So let's read it together. Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. They cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped and saying, truly, you are the Son of God. I want to talk for a few moments about walking into the life of the miraculous. Whether it's your own storm that you're facing or a storm that God has put you in to be a voice of the supernatural, a voice of, 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 the, of the Lord into, God is teaching us, I believe, through this story, how to walk into the supernatural. First thing, notice, they did not recognize Jesus. Now, I know there can be some practical things. It was stormy. It was nighttime. He may have been a distance away. But if I can extrapolate from that, they never saw Jesus walk on the water before. And so they, Jesus came in a way, in a methodology they'd never encountered before. And sometimes we end up discerning what's God or not based on our previous experience rather than who he really is. Does that make sense? Sometimes God will come and do things in a way that we've never seen happen before. And so we're automatically, and what did it say? It's a ghost. What is a ghost? It's a demonic appearance. And so they at first were misunderstanding what God was doing. This happened in different times. But, you know, you go through revival history. I was talking about this morning. But even back in the 90s during what was called the Pensacola uh, Revival and, and the Toronto Blessing, and, and uh, we saw it happen in our meetings, and maybe you did too, things were happening where people were falling into the power of the Spirit. The joy of the Lord was happening, and people were laughing hilariously. Sometimes people would uh, shake under the power of God. Things were happening that were outside the realm of what many of us had encountered. And so there are well-meaning people that said, that doesn't look like the Jesus I know. That doesn't look like what I grew up with. That is not how I recognize Jesus. And they immediately call it demonic. Now understand, anytime God's moving, the enemy's going to try to bring uh, uh, the false. And sometimes there's flesh and, and emotion in it. But in the midst of the things that weren't God, God was at work. So if we're going to move into the miraculous, we've got to learn how to recognize the Spirit of God according to the Word and discernment of the Spirit and not just our own practical experience. Let me try to give you an illustration. I may have told you the story one time before. Back in 1999, Kim and I, our pastor at the time, Ron Johnson, and a Bible teacher named Marilyn Hickey, the four of us were in Siberia together ministering. And um, in in the middle of it, uh, I'll shorten what could be a 10-minute story into a couple of minutes. But a um, a 16, 17-year-old girl um, uh, came in, interrupted the service, and began to manifest uh, demonically. And my pastor looked at Kim and I, and under his breath, he said, go cast the demons out of her. (laughs) I wanted to say, why don't you go cast the demons out, and I'll teach. But, you know, he was a pastor. Yes, sir. So um, we got a couple of the uh, American intercessors and a couple of the Russian intercessors. We took the young lady to a room uh, behind the, uh, the, the, the platform so as not to interrupt the rest of the meeting. And so, you know, if you've ever been around uh, d- demonic things when, when, when you know, uh, when, when, when Pentecostals are there, you know, when Pentecostals are there and, and demonic things show up, they just start screaming and hollering and yelling in tongues. 
and nothing wrong with that. But um, after 15 or 20 minutes of yelling in tongues and pleading the blood and everything else, nothing was happening. The girl was still bound. So Kim and I began saying, Lord, what, what's happening? What's going on? And, and so uh, Kim, who is, is a seer, she sees a lot in the revelation, revelational realm, she, um, in a vision, she saw the girl's house. She literally, it's like she was taking a tour of the girl's house. She saw the furniture, the curtains, the, the drapes, the, the color, the, you know, everything. She saw her room, and, and um, she saw when, when she was, this young girl was first abused in, in her room, and it began a whole process of not only being hurt and abused and used, but then she medicated her own pain by willingly getting involved in sin and immorality and opened the door to a lot of demonic torment in her life. And so... Kim looked at her, and through the interpreter, uh, the girl had calmed down a little bit. She described her house to her, and, and the girl's just freaking out. Her eyes are bugging out of her head because this American is telling her the rooms, the color, the furniture, and what happened to her when she was a young girl in her room. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Russ, she needs to look in your eyes, and I will set her free. Now, guys, I went to four years of Bible college. I'd cast some demons out before, but I'd never heard of somebody looking in their eyes to get the demons cast out. You're not going to find chapter and verse for that, but you're also not going to find that it violates Scripture. It's kind of like when Jesus spit in dirt and put it in a blind man's eyes. How many of you think we ought to make a standard practice out of that? I'll go get some dirt. Everybody with glasses, come on. I'll get ready. <laughs> you know, and so anyway. And so... I did not recognize this expression of the Holy Spirit from any of my previous experience. But the Holy Spirit said, this doesn't violate Scripture, and I'm telling you, she needs to look in your eyes. So after a few minutes of, of, of uh, you know, her, her reticent to do it, she looked in my eyes, and when she did, the demons fled, screaming, et cetera, et cetera. She quit manifesting, and she gave her life to Jesus, baptized, and was just speaking in other tongues. And later on, she said, when I looked in your eyes, she said, typically for the last years, when I've looked in a man's eyes, it's lust and, and abuse looking at me out of, out of the soul, the windows of the eye of the soul, uh, uh, the, the eyes of the windows of the soul. And she said, but when I looked in your eyes, it's like I saw the love of God. Now, it had nothing to do with this physical person. You know, I don't make a standard of it. I, I tell people I ought to write a book called The Eye Anointing, and for $50, I'll stare at you. <laughs> I, you know, manipulation. You know, don't be gullible by all this stuff you hear see on the Internet and TV. But, but anyway, I, I did not recognize that, but God was in that. And so the disciples did not recognize Jesus because he was coming in a different way. I heard somebody say it this way, God will offend the mind to reveal the heart. Sometimes God will do things that offend our religious sensibilities, but he's looking to see, are we more married to our religious traditions or to revelation of the Spirit of God through Jesus Christ based on the foundation of the Word? So number one, if we're going to move into the miraculous, we need to recognize Jesus. Number two, Jesus said to them when they were afraid, he said, take courage. Notice Jesus didn't say, receive courage. Come on, disciples, lift your hands and receive courage as I impart it to you. Have you ever gone to an altar said, preacher, pray for me that I have courage? Well, guys, the reality is courage is not an impartation. It is something that you and I have to be willing to grab a hold of, to take courage. So one time I was preaching at uh, Indy 500. Anybody ever watch the, the auto races, Indy 500? Well, I love the auto race, but for a week before the auto race in Indianapolis, it is 500,000 drunk rednecks. And it is violent, it is perverse, and we're right down in the middle of all of that preaching. And so one time we are, we're preaching, and, and about 10 of these you know, half-drunk guys, they, they, they mooned us. I mean, they turned around and dropped trout and mooned us. My, my, uh, the, my street preacher mentor, he didn't miss a beat. He just kept on preaching and said, you can reveal part of your nakedness now, but one day you're going to stand completely naked before God. You know, I love it. This is the way he did it. But uh, we're preaching, and so I'm holding a, uh, a battery-powered uh, uh, speaker. It can reach a half mile. It's called a half-mile hailer. And the preacher is behind me. He's preaching. And we have to have about five or six people in front of us with leather jackets to deflect the full beer cans and beer bottles that are being thrown at us. All right? 
And so um, one, one guy slips through those guys and comes at me because I'm the front line other than the guards, and he pulls out a knife and comes right at my stomach with a knife. Thankfully, the guy standing next to me, he had not been saved very long. He'd been part of the Hawaiian mafia before he got saved. That's the kind of people you want street preaching with you. He disarmed the guy, took care of it. But it was in the midst of all of this going on. And then, um, you know, so we had to take courage in the midst of it. So we're there, we're preaching, and two guys start fighting. It was two different races, and they were fighting. The crowd was thirsty for blood. They're just going, and God spoke to some of our team to get in the middle of the fight and break it up. How many of you know, without God telling you, that is foolishness in a crowd like that? You call the cops. You don't try to break it up yourself. But God spoke to them. So they took courage that made no natural sense, and they broke up the fight. They began witnessing to the two guys, and the crowd of about 300 people were silent because both guys lifted their hands, tears coming down their face, and on top of their lungs, they're confessing and repenting and getting saved. Guys, we had to take courage. So when you face the trials and the tribulations and the storms, or God sits you in a place where you've got to be the voice of the Lord in an impossible situation, don't just wait for courage to come upon you. Arise, take courage, because God wants to do the miraculous. So number one, recognize Jesus. Number two, take courage. Number three, have faith. Peter did not get out of the boat out of his own volition. He waited till he heard the word of the Lord, come. We are not to be, um, the word has slipped me. We are not to make our own decisions. We need to wait on the word of the Lord. I told you this morning, we have authority in Christ, correct? But that authority is not at my own will. It's his will. I don't just in any situation command healing, command this, command that, because it's not my authority. It's his authority. And so I need to wait to hear the word of the Lord, but I need to have faith in what God says. 2 Chronicles 20.20 says, believe God's prophets and you will prosper. That doesn't mean that everybody that gives you a word that you believe it. It doesn't mean that every prophecy you read on the internet you believe because we got to test prophecy. Thessalonians, we test every prophetic word. But when God has spoken, when you know it meets the the test of Scripture and the witness of the Spirit and your pastoral counsel, you hold on to the Word of the Lord because God who has promised is faithful to finish it. And then the Word of Scripture, we're told to fight, the fight of faith with the Word of the Lord over our lives, spiritually, prophetically, and biblically. And so we need that faith. But where does that faith come from? The faith in what God says comes because we have faith in who He is. I don't just believe every prophetic word, but I know the character of my God. I know the the heart of my God. Why? Because I have His word and because I have relationship with Him. So we have got to learn to have faith, to grow in faith in the written word of the Lord, the prophetic word of the Lord, and ultimately in the Lord Himself, knowing that even if he, I don't see the healing, He is still the healer. Even if I don't see the provision, He's still Jehovah Jireh. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Even if we don't see the answer that we're contending for yet, He's still our God and great and mighty. So we have faith. Number four, we need to Excuse me, be confident. We need to have a confidence in Christ in me. Peter, the audacious Peter, was willing to say, if it's really you, call me to do something impossible. You see, that was not a self-confidence. A lot of the world wants to tell us to be confident in who you are. Self-confidence, it's all about self, self self-fulfillment, self-actualization, everything else. It's not about self. My confidence to preach and pray and prophesy and cast out devils, to get on TV or in front of a crowd in person of 20 or 30 or 40,000 people and declare the name of Jesus and see the blind, see the deaf hear, the lame walk, demons cast out. It doesn't come because I think I'm so great or I'm so confident in my own ability and power. I blow it time after time after time because God uses weak vessels, but we put ourselves in His hands. And so my confidence, your confidence, is not who you are, It's who He is in you. Galatians 2.20, one of the prophets that we were mentored by, we were with him in in communist Poland in the 80s. And I remember um, in Europe, 
In a lot of parts of the world, they have 220 electrical power instead of 110, like we have here in America. And so he was preaching the key to real power, 220s, like what we use to run air conditioners or dryers, things like that, that need more power. And so he would say the key to 220 power is Galatians 220, which is I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's not me who's alive. It's Christ that lives in me. In the life that I'm now living, I don't live by my own flesh, my own self. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So my confidence is not who I am in Christ. It's who Christ is in me. And I take my identity because of that. So my confidence and Peter's confidence to step out of the boat was found in Christ. Number five, we have to be willing to respond. Can I tell you it's a dangerous prayer to say, God, here I am, use me. God, here I am, send me. God, here I am, prophesy through me. God, here I am, cast out demons through me. God, here I am, let me lay hands on the sick and see them healed. That's a dangerous prayer because God will put you in a situation to test and see, are you willing? Are you willing to say, Lord, I am available even if I look foolish? So we need to be willing to respond. Number six, we need to know what the command of the Lord is. Peter um, when, when the Lord said, come, he recognized, and God gave him clear direction. Let me try to explain it this way. One of the prayers I pray and have for years before a, a service, a time of ministry, I say, God, what is your word, what is your will, and what is your way? God, what is your word? What do you want to say today? God, what is your will? What do you, what do you want to accomplish today? But then I'll say, God, what is your way? How do you want to do it? In other words, I don't want to fall into a pattern of doing the same thing the same way. Remember we talked about this morning, insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, expect different results? I want to learn to follow the flow of the Holy Spirit and to be able to put my finger in the wind as a word of the Spirit of God and say, he's blowing this way, he's blowing this way. I want to know what the command of the Lord is. And so sometimes it might be praying and petitioning. Oh, God, I ask you in Jesus' name, would you come? And by the power of the name of Jesus, Lord, would you release healing? There are times that we pray and ask, but there are times when we speak it. But I've got to know what his command is. I don't want to uh, be presumptuous in that. And so, know what the command of the Lord is and the timing of God. That's number six. Number seven, obedience. When Jesus said, come, Peter seemingly did not delay. He jumped out of the boat. Have you ever heard that phrase, delayed obedience is disobedience? I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you felt the Holy Spirit uh, stirring you, prompting you, leading you to witness to somebody or pray for somebody, and you didn't do it because of fear, because of whatever. And then you heard later that they died or maybe they moved away and you had no more chance, and you think, God, was I their last chance? Have you, I don't know if you've ever been there. I have not just in ministry, but in, in life. Now, if we're not careful, we can get overrun with guilt. I'm not advocating guilt, guys. I, this is what I pray. I say, God, even in my disobedience, even in my fear, God, would you send somebody else to do what I wasn't able or willing to do? But I cannot shirk my responsibility just by praying a prayer. You know, um, I think it was a song said, you're the only Jesus some will ever see. Guys, when Jesus says to witness, to give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, to buy a homeless person a meal at McDonald's and share a little prayer with them, when God says lay hands on the sick person and believe I'm going to heal, when God speaks to your heart, be willing to say, yes, God, here I am, and get out of the boat, believing that the impossible will happen, not because of who you are and what you do, but because Jesus is there calling you to step out. So obedience to the word of the Lord. You remember when um, the armies of Israel were facing the Philistines and Goliath? And it says that every day the Israelite army would prepare for battle. They'd run out to battle, shouting the battle cry. And when Goliath came out, they turned tail and ran like cowards. 
Can you imagine the foolishness of an army, a big strapping army with armor and swords and spears, and they're running, you know, bless the God of Israel, blowing the shofars and shouting, and one lone giant, one lone man comes out and defies them, and like little I was going to say little girls, but you can't say that in, the, in, in 2023. You know, like little cowards, they run away. Isn't that just like us? We come to church. Man, we shout the battle cry. Sometimes in worship we wave banners or blow shofars. But tomorrow, let some demonic giant get in your face and lie to you and say, I'm going to take you out, I'm going to take your family, I'm going to destroy your life. And if we're not careful, we run like little cowards. Instead of standing like the champions that God has promised that we will be more than conquerors and, and victorious through Christ. So we've got to be obedient and not allow all these things to hinder us. Let's come to a close and we move into ministry. <clears throat> Number eight, we need to be willing to be uncomfortable. How many of you think when Peter got out and started walking on the water, he was not... Uh, comfortable. He was not over the confident. He was looking and watching. Is this even possible? Can I tell you something? It's an exciting ride to move in the miraculous, but you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. You have to be willing for something, for nothing to seeming to happen. You got to be willing to look wrong. There are times we'll call out a word of knowledge and, you know, specificity, sometimes a name or some, a very specific condition, and nobody responds. So you end up looking foolish. And then afterwards, some, you know, dear saint of God comes up and says, well, that was for me. That's my name. That's my condition. But I was just, a, I didn't want to come up in front of everybody. Will you pray for me? Can I tell you my natural reaction is, no, I'm not going to pray for you. You made me look like a fool in front of the whole congregation. Is that okay to be real? But we, we push that aside and we say, sure, I'll pray for you. You've got to be willing to be uncomfortable, willing to look wrong, because it's not about you. It's not about your reputation. It's about God wanting to touch and heal and deliver and save people. So be willing to be uncomfortable stepping out of the boat. Number nine, we have to focus on Jesus and not the circumstances. Sometimes... We pray and we pray and we pray and we pray, and it seems nothing happens. I remember one time there was a young man where we lived, uh, is a young teenage boy. He had had debilitating asthma for years, and I felt the Holy Spirit telling me that I was to go and soak him in prayer. And so um, if anybody remembers the praise uh, tapes, cassette tapes from Integrity Hosanna Music back in the 80s, there was a song on one of those that, I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord your healer. So I took that tape and I, I put it on, I, I, somehow or another, I got it on, on loop. And I went over with the permission of the parents to their house. And for hours, I played that over and over as I just prayed over that, that young man. For hours. And nothing seemed to be happening. Nothing was going on. I'd anoint with oil. I'd declare healing. I'd ask for healing. Nothing seemed to be happening. But instead of getting discouraged and giving up, I kept praying. I kept soaking him in the presence of God. I went two or three days in a row and spent hours doing all of this. And, and I, I finally left, not out of defeat, but I, that, that was all I had time to do because of our schedule. And I heard from him about a week later that that afternoon of the third day, the young man got up and went outside and was running around with his friends completely healed of, of lifetime asthma. But it, it came not because I spoke a word and immediately was there. I had to be willing to press in and not give up, to focus on what the Lord said and who he is and his promises and not on what I saw. There was a, a, a leader, a, a pastor, a preacher named John Wimber, started the Vineyard Churches. Years ago, I remember hearing him one time, and he said he had the revelation of Jesus as the healer, and so he started praying for the sick. Not only were people not getting healed. I mean, he had crowds of hundreds, even thousands. He'd pray for hours for tons of sick people, and not only was nobody getting healed, people were getting sicker. And then people he prayed for were dying. I mean, even though that's not how to build a healing ministry. 
But he focused on the word of promise rather than the circumstances. And so he kept praying, kept praying, kept praying until all of a sudden one person got healed. And then another. And then it was just an explosion that he saw not only in his ministry, but equipping others to move in the healing of God. And so we focus not on the circumstances, but on Jesus. Number 10, we need to know what to do in an emergency. Peter got his focus on the waves, the storm, and he began to sink. Instead of saying, I'm a failure. God, you called me to walk in faith, and I failed. I'm going down. That's the end. He said, Lord, help. There's nothing wrong with being in the midst of a storm. There's nothing wrong with being the one God wants to use and saying, God, nothing's working. Help. And Jesus reached down, pulled him up. Let me tell you something. We sang it tonight. I think we talked about it this morning. Some Isaiah 43. You can be in the midst of the floods and the river. They will not drown you. You can be in the midst of the fire. It will not kindle upon you. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I tell you what, these three Hebrew young men that said, we will not bow the knee. And King you said, look, I'm going to burn you in the fire. And they said, look, our God is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us. That was a statement of faith. But here's a statement of faithfulness. They said, even if he doesn't deliver us, we still will not bow the knee. See, there are a lot of people, they serve God as long as God's doing things their way. But God's looking for the kind of heart these three Hebrew young men have. Even if God doesn't do the miracle, we're not going to bow. So you know the story of the throwing in the fire. The fire is so hot it kills the guards to throw them in. And the king rises and says, wait a minute, we threw three men in there, but I see four men. And the fourth man's like the son of God. They were not only kept from burning, but when they came out, the only thing that burned were their bondages. And you know what it says? They didn't even smell like smoke. I want you to know the promise of God is not that Jesus is going to be with us in the fire, that you and I are coming out of the wilderness. We're coming out of the fire. We're coming out of the flood. And we're not going to be marked by what happened yesterday. Your identity is not found in your past. It's found in Christ and who's making you in the future. And so we don't even smell like our trial. Have you ever met people? They have a past and they hold on to that and that's their identity. And so every conversation, they want to repeat their trials and their troubles of 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Yeah, I've heard this story about 20 times. I I want to say to people, would you get healed and get a life? See, that's why I'm not a pastor. Somebody wants to come and complain about the same thing over and over again. I'm saying, look, God gave you the power. Get free and get a life. Amen. And there's your prophecy for tonight. (laughs) Lord, save me. Two final things. Be willing to receive correction. I said this morning, I think that Peter, I don't think Jesus carried Peter back to the boat. I think Peter walked on the water with Jesus back to the boat. Do you know what? Even when we fail, even when we have to be rescued, even when we lose courage, Jesus doesn't just save us. He puts us back on the path of walking in the miraculous. They get back to the boat, and Jesus makes a statement that at first makes very little sense. He said, oh, you of little faith. You know, if if Pastor Tim and I were to go out to a body of water, a lake somewhere around, and Tim were to say, hey, watch this, Russ, and he were to start walking on the water, I'd be pretty impressed. How about you? I don't think I'd have the audacity to say, Tim, your face sure is small. I'd be impressed by the measure of faith. But you see, the word Jesus used in the Greek there doesn't mean small, little. It means short. So hear it this way. Jesus said, oh, you of a short burst of faith. And isn't that how it happens many times? Because faith is a grain of mustard seed will remove a mountain. It's not about big faith. It's tiny faith in a big God. But what we need is faith that lasts. That means we get a prophetic word. We fall under the power of the Spirit. We hear an anointed sermon, and our faith leaps. But when the congregation is gone, when the worship is silenced, when we no longer hear the ringing words of the preacher in our ear, our faith falls. We need to have faith that lasts in the midst of the battle. 
and don't give up. So being a little faith is not about small faith. It's about short faith, and God wants our faith to be lasting. And then finally, keep on walking. Keep on walking because we serve a God of the miraculous. We sang it tonight. He's the God of the impossible. And God uses normal, ordinary people to do the impossible. And so tonight we want to pray for that which looks impossible in your life to surrender to the all-powerful God. There's a song, I was, I was praying it during worship. <laughs> You're the way maker. Do you remember that song? You're the way maker. He makes a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. He gets the valley and raises it up. He gets the mountain and makes it low. He gets a crooked way and makes it straight. He delivers us from all power.